If you're a beer nerd in the United States like me, then you know there is truly one style that rules them all in this market. The IPA. IPAs are bold, bitter, and everywhere. But in a nation that had prohibition and a subsequent addiction to light lagers, it can be tough to see how exactly that happened. That journey from obscure beer style to industry leader is something I want to retread in this video today. And as a bit of a hophead, I couldn't be more excited. If you're excited as well, leave a like down below and let's dive into this great story. Now the full origin story of the progenitor beer, the British IPA, will be left to a previous video on this channel I did a couple years back. The link to that one is in the description below. A way too quick historical summary was that the IPA was born out of new technology and marketplaces opening up to the British brewing industry. First, the development of better malting kilns led to the increased use of pale malts in brewing, and pale colored ales were quickly becoming popular all across Europe. And at the same time, the British were colonizing almost anywhere they could sail a ship to, and this led brewers to create beers that were stronger and hoppier allowing them to survive long voyages at sea without spoiling. With pale ales and colonization being all the rage, beer marketers in the UK gave these beers the moniker India Pale Ale, and they were all the rage during the 19th century. As a British colony, IPAs were fairly popular in the US up until the mid 1800s, and this is because it was by no means an obscure style of beer. But as waves and waves of German immigrants moved into the country seeking religious and economic opportunities, beer styles like Pilsner's and other lagered beers quickly began to eclipse the demands for ales. By the time Prohibition came and went, IPAs had been relegated to a much lower status in the American beer market as lagers and light lagers came to dominate after the ban on beer was lifted in the 1930s. Not all breweries abandoned the IPA after Prohibition though. Ballantine IPA was a big hit in the 1960s and 70s and kept the pre-Prohibition ale tradition alive in the United States during its time. Cited by Michael Jackson as, no, not that Michael Jackson, the beer one, God. Cited by Michael Jackson as wonderfully distinctive, an outstanding American ale unique in its fidelity to the East Coast tradition of colonial ales. While this beer did have a decent run after Prohibition, the brewery would find itself acquired by the Pabst Brewing Empire, and production stopped in 1996, but it was recently brought back for nostalgic beer fans. For big brewers like Ballantyne and eventually Pabst, IPAs just weren't popular enough in the 1980s and 90s to justify a spot in their huge and costly supply chains. But all that was about to change thanks to some fortuitous advancements in agriculture. Hop breeding experimentation programs began in the United States in the 1930s in an attempt to bolster the once again legal brewing industry. The traditional European hops weren't optimized to grow in the US climate, and were still quite susceptible to diseases and pests. The US Department of Agriculture set out to change all this, and some 30 years later, experimental hop number 56013 was harvested for research. The variety did receive some positive feedback during its initial evaluation, but ultimately didn't develop much interest from brewers. But one farmer, John Segal, decided to continue trials of this hop on three acres of his own land. A few years later, a generation of young brewers took notice of that hop, and the Cascade hop was finally released to the public. Fritz Maytag, who had purchased San Francisco's Anchor Brewing in 1965, felt inspired by this new American hop, and set out to make a beer like the Ballantine IPA but this time with all American hops. When his recipe was complete in 1975, Liberty Ale would be the first beer to feature the now famous Cascade profile of balanced bitterness and citrus aromas. A few years later, Ken Grossman, an avid home brewer, was diving into the new and exciting world of American hops. He and his partner started a brewery called Sierra Nevada, and to celebrate their first Christmas, they brewed an IPA inspired by Ballantine, but dry hopped with Cascade hops. The beer was bitter, 
hop forward and bursting with flavor. And their celebration fresh hop ale is still a holiday staple for beer nerds to this day. With the prominent featuring of American hops, Liberty Ale and Celebration Ale were the two first American IPAs, a style that would be set to start a beer revolution. The few craft brewers of the 1980s and 90s quickly found that American IPAs were quite the differentiator from the market offerings being put forth by the increasingly consolidated brewing conglomerates. They were churning out pilsners and other light lagers that promised quality through consistency and hundreds of years of brewing traditions. American IPAs were anything but all of that. They were experimental and foreign to most drinkers' palates, and although this gets glossed over, they were anything but consistent. These small brewers were still working out how to quality control these ales and tweaking their recipes, and before taproom laws were changed to help craft brewers, they were forced to rely on distributors who didn't have any experience with unpasteurized ales that had to be consumed relatively fresh. But despite these challenges, the American IPA fit in perfectly with the punk rock and counterculture movement of the late 80s and early 90s. Drinking a craft IPA was seen as cool, experimental, and rebellious in comparison to the simpler lockers everyone else was drinking, and craft beer fans embraced this attitude wholeheartedly. Competing over who could brew the bitterest beer and which obscure hop variety made it into your IPA became standard for the cult brewers of craft beer. And while this culture of experimentation and rebellion against the corporate beer machine certainly helped make the IPA the most popular beer style in the US, I think there are some key economic factors that really ensured IPA was going to capture the number one spot in craft beer. First things first, when compared to some other styles, IPAs are quite fast to brew. If you design your recipes and brewing processes correctly, you can go from pitching yeast to kegging beer in about two weeks for an IPA. Compare that to a clear and clean pilsner or heavy imperial stout that might need six weeks or more, and that is quite the difference in time investment. And this is especially important for small breweries who have limited production space and face great fluctuations in demand. As one brewer I recently spoke to put it to me, lagers are death when it comes to production schedules. We try to keep a pills or dark lager on to keep customers happy, but we can dedicate that tank to an imperial stout and make 10 times the profit, or get 6 batches of trendy IPAs or ales in the same time. This conversation really opened my eyes and helped me learn that brewing beers commercially is a delicate balance and IPAs offer more flexibility to brewers than many other styles of beer. And flexibility is something that craft beer consumers love as well. I have covered this topic to death on this channel, but one of the biggest things craft beer lovers value is being able to try lots and lots of new beers. Variety is the spice of life for most craft beer lovers, and IPAs not only allow brewers to churn out more beers with limited production space, but also allow them to showcase a greater variety of American hops and brewing techniques. This is one of the biggest reasons you might walk into a brewery and see half of their menu or more dominated by IPAs and pale ales. The next big factor is that IPAs are fairly cheap to produce. Malt and hops are something that almost every beer style needs, so brewers are able to get some decent economies of scale when purchasing these ingredients for their beer portfolios. And the hops typically featured in American IPAs like Cascade, Chinook, and Simcoe are not too expensive as they are widely grown because they're always in demand. Your standard American IPA also doesn't use a lot of expensive adjuncts that you only buy for a batch or two of beer. This lower cost allows brewers to keep the beer flowing even if cash flow gets a little tight seasonally. Finally, and this kind of goes without saying, but IPAs are great for brewers because they're in demand. People love IPAs and are almost always willing to pay some good money for them. IPAs really drive business, 
And in a world where brewing beer requires huge startup costs and the pressure is on to sell barrel after barrel of beer while competing with some 7,000 other craft brewers, IPAs offer some cash flow stability because they're quick to make, they aren't too expensive, and being in constant demand has allowed the U.S. to rise to more than 7,000 breweries, with openings still outpacing the closings. And it's all these economic factors, I believe, helped IPAs rise to dominate craft beer tap rooms across the country. Today, IPAs account for 26.5% of all craft beer dollar volume and continue to drive most of the volume growth for the craft beer market segment. Despite the thousands of breweries that have opened since the emergence of the American IPA, craft beer in the U.S. is still defined by it. Without American IPAs, I'm sure craft beer would be a much more regional and fragmented industry. And while brewers try to figure out how to make New England IPAs profitable with their expensive adjuncts, or grow demand for spin-off styles like Brute IPAs, this beer nerd takes comfort in the fact that the good old American IPA will be there, continuing to be the hoppy and aromatic lifeblood of the craft beer industry.